The author who've come to chat with us today and give us a glimpse into their writing journey is Mary Ann Yard, international best-selling multi-award winning author of the Dulac Chronicles. Hello Mary. It's hi. A bit, hi. <laughs> it's a particular honour and a privilege to interview you as my first author because oh, I you. love your books and your style oh, of writing. I really do. So your books are set at the time just after King Arthur, am I right? Yeah, it's like 20 years uh, after his death. So the world is in chaos wow. and the nights are all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> well, what fascinates me particularly is how you focus on Lancelot du Lac's sons. Am I saying it correctly? Yeah, Lancelot yeah, Lancelot, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So for those um, who don't know... Could you tell us a little bit about who he was and that period, please, and what made you write about that period in particular? Well, the period I write about is, right, yeah, I've always been fascinated with Arthurian legends. I actually grew up near Glastonbury, which is oh, wow. the home of the ancient Isle of Avalon, right. if you believe in that, and of course the resting place of Arthur and Guinevere at Glastonbury Abbey, if you believe that as well. So I was always fascinated by the stories in particular, Lancelot, who who is fundamental in um, the Arthurian story. So he actually didn't come into the story until the 12th century. Right. So he was an unknown until then. And then he, he, he got quite a pivotal role as the perfect knight, um, Arthur's best friend, mm -hmm. who goes a bit astray and has an affair with Arthur's wife and <laughs> brings down King Arthur and, the, and basically... So that's the end of Arthur, really, his betrayal, then Mordred, and that's it, poor Arthur. So oh. he's, he's kind of the bad guy, yeah. but he's also a good guy, and, and you can't help but love him. He's a real rogue, I think, Lancelot. So um, I wanted to explore what happened after Arthur's death. So Arthur's dead, and the story, the Arthurian legends, kind of ends there. So the knights disappear, Lancelot becomes a hermit, and no more is heard of them. So I was wondering, well, what actually happened? I wanted to write a story about, well, perhaps they didn't all become hermits or they didn't all die or disappear. Yeah. And, that, and I wanted to um, put them in this changing Britannia world where the Saxons are coming over and, and they're taking over Arthurian, you know, Arthur's land, really. Right. And, and I wanted to put them against these knights who, who are still there, but it's like the next generation of knights. So it's their right. children trying to find their place. Yeah. in this very different world to what their fathers had lived in. So that's... That's, <laughs> that's amazing, that's actually. It, it, it really is amazing because what genuinely fascinates me is how did you come up with the idea of, of the Lancelot Chronicles? Because it's one thing to think about well, what happened afterwards and, you know, and I think it's probably something that not very many people would have thought of. You I know what I mean? Yeah, it's the King Arthur story. People are interested in the King Arthur mm. story. And um, for me, I never particularly liked Arthur all that much. I preferred the knights. Oh. So I think I wanted, because Lancelot is cast as this, you know, rogue, as I've said before, who does these terrible things. But I wanted him to have a reason that wasn't just Guinevere right. as to why he's done these things. Yeah. Uh, and the consequences on everybody, him doing this. So I wanted it all from that family's point of view, from the Delac's point of view. So, you know, how they saw it, what happened. So it's a different contrast. So you've got the two contrasts. You've got the Pendragons, which is Arthur's family, right. and the Delac's, which is Lancelot's, and you have them clashing. So it's kind of like a War of the Roses. It's brilliant, actually. It's, a, it's an absolutely <laughs> brilliant concept. But one thing that I particularly is, I wondered if one of the sons were Guinevere's sons. Oh, no. I don't think no. so, not yet. I mean, the story, actually, there is, because there are some historical characters in my books, and mm. um, Buddick, the lack, mm -hmm. is actually a historical character. Right. So, well, a legendary historical character. It's kind of a bit iffy with Brittany as to who was what, where, when. <laughs> so, you know, that family, Buddick's family, had this connection with Lancelot. Right. Possibly his father was Lancelot. It's all very kind of iffy as to who he was. Right. So I wanted him into the story, and then I wanted him to have brothers that he would clash with, and right. you know, so you get that kind of tension going on. What's going on, in Brittany? What's yeah. going on in Cornwall? And then what's going on in Wessex? Yeah, as well. So let me just also you you mentioned that Buddick might 
be a real person. Yeah. What, it's quite difficult sometimes to write about real people, isn't it? So what are the ethics of writing about historical figures? I think you have to be careful. I mean, you have to respect them. The, the, the problem with the Dark Ages is a lot of it is folklore. Right. So there's not an awful lot of primary, reliable primary written sources. Yeah. So you're, you're kind of trying to find myths and make them real people. Right. Which is all about Arthurian legend and that era. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you have a responsibility not to go too far from their story. But at the same time, you want to make them flesh and blood and real people. Right. So it's a challenge. Yeah. So it's work to get them how you think they should be. I cannot recommend these books highly enough. They are brilliantly written. Really amazing. I love them. So let me ask you, which of the characters do you relate to most strongly? Or is that a really unfair question? <laughs> oh, that's a difficult that's a difficult one. I mean, I, I do like my bad characters, so, uh -huh. you know, I do like the wicked ones. The bad I think boys. Merton has, yeah, the bad boys, but well, I think Merton's really the, the star of the show. He kind of takes over. Um, so I enjoy writing about him, but I do actually, I really enjoy writing about Josephine, who's, who's a real little madam, you know, and, <laughs> <laughs> because she's just so nasty. So I quite like doing the nasty characters, but yeah, I mean, they've all got their own little characteristics. And, yeah. And so it's, it's good fun writing about them all. So how much research do you actually have to do before you write? I do loads and loads of research because it's set in the Dark Ages. So I wanted that era, that 6th century, mm. to be as real as I could make it. So, right. you know, bookshelves on you know, the Saxons, the Celts, Britain in this time. So, so yeah, it's, it's a lot of research and then mm. throwing the legends on top and then they will take you on some like false trails sometime and you'll <laughs> find, oh, I know who they are. No, I don't. I haven't got a clue. <laughs> kind of like, you know, it's like a little jigsaw puzzle you're trying yeah. to put of all these people. We put all these ancient texts. So, I mean, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles is one of my best friends. Wow. But it's just, it's just all like, most of it's fairy tale. It's like, you know, you can't take any of it too seriously, <laughs> but there's some interesting little nuggets in there and you think, oh, that would be good. I yeah. can work that way. Honestly, it's fascinating. And it's a fascinating period of time, I think, as well. And as you said earlier, people are really interested to know about King Arthur, but I think you've really tapped into something by going beyond and finding out what happened around him and after him, after his life, you know? That's an area that I don't think many people have explored. I certainly haven't come across it. And it's to me, almost now more fascinating <laughs> than the King Arthur period, which is brilliant. Yeah, yeah. King Arthur, and I, I just, I didn't want to write another King Arthur. Yeah, he's a great it, guy. Book. Yeah. Know, so. Been done to it, death. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, from a different perspective. Could you tell us a little bit about how you brainstorm your ideas? Well, actually, I mean, the Dark Chronicles was a dream. I had this dream. Oh of, my. This, it was very bizarre, very real. You know, one of those real dreams. Yeah. Where I had this, um, it was it was a nighttime dream. And they were in a castle, and it was this fighting going on. And I was like, "What on earth is this going on?" But that's what it was. It was actually Lancelot. It was the Lancelot. I was thinking, "Oh my gosh, that's Lancelot! What is he doing?" And mm -hmm. and that's where it came about. So I mean, it took me well, it was like fifteen years ago. I started the very first book of the Delac Chronicles, and the very first story. I'm gonna tell you something was actually Lancelot's story. Oh, so wow. I actually had, my first book was all about Lancelot and it was his journey. And, and I got to the end of that. It was rubbish. I mean, it's the most appalling story you'd ever read. It's, it's really <laughs> rubbish. But <laughs> I got to the end of that and I thought, I don't want to finish writing. I want to write again. So I thought, well, right, well, Lancelot can have some children and we'll go from there. So that's how that was that was born. It came from a dream. That's and then amazing. I wrote this this Lancelot story and then, I thought well, I'd just carry on until, you know. That's I fantastic. I, I rewrote it about 25 times, I think. I mean, it slowly got better each time. Wow, <laughs> it that's was amazing. I so, looking at the old ones and going, oh my days, you know, it's like, what an appalling, <laughs> appalling manuscript. <laughs> but I think all, all first drafts are sort of just for us, really, aren't they? I mean, yeah. you can't really let people see that. But um, how long did it take between finishing... Lancelot's book that never made the light of day <laughs> to, to these to these uh, yeah well I think the, the first book the Dark Chronicles 
Well, it took about, I don't know, a good 10 years of rewriting it, rewriting it, rewriting it until it kind of makes sense. And and once I got that done and, and went through the whole process of getting it out, the Delight Devil, the next book, which was Merton, and um, of course that took me six months because, you know, he doesn't stop. So <laughs> so that's that was, you know, a bit quicker than 12 years. The next one, the Delight Princess, that took me a year, and the one I'm doing at the moment, is probably going to take me a good year as well. So, well, so, yeah. I have to say that's kind of comforting to know because we live in a world where people, I hear people saying all the time, you've got to write faster, you've got to have more books and everything. And so it's fantastic to hear from someone who've achieved as much as you have and have written these amazing books that it's okay that it takes this long, you know, because. I don't write very fast either. And I know that there are um, a number of authors who don't. They don't write that fast. We've got other things in our lives as well. So it's difficult sometimes. So it's very comforting to know. <laughs> that... I, I think if I, I was to write fast, you'd lose a lot. Because yeah. there's just no way I could get the details in all the, uh, the story or the characters right if I was writing a lot quicker. It just wouldn't. I'd love to be able to <laughs> get a book out every 90 days, but not going to happen yeah. with this series. <laughs> uh, but also, I, I suppose in this specific genre, it might be too difficult to do that anyway. Yeah. I suppose if it was a different genre of book, then it might be slightly slightly easier to write faster. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so when you develop your characters, do you already know who they are before you begin yeah. writing, or do you develop them as they go? Uh, no, I have an idea as who they are and where they're going to go. Right. So to take Josephine, for example, she's quite nice in book one, but there's that little edge to her where you can just tell something's going to brew with her, <laughs> and then she just completely flips in book two. So right. I do have this plan of where these people are going, which is good fun. Sometimes they surprise me, usually Merton, but, you know, it's, <laughs> you know some of them have their own ideas as to where they want to go, and... Uh, but most of the time I know where they're meant to be. So. Yeah. Um, so that leads me on to the fact, well, Merton is my personal favourite. Yeah, he's <laughs> um, most people's. <laughs> oh, he's brilliant. I just, I love him. I love everything about him. I mean, apart from the fact that he's a bit crazy, he's, he, I love his integrity, his loyalty, and he's, he's got fearless courage. But he also has a kind of sense of fun. So I was wondering, how do you select the names for your characters? All right, uh, they, well, if they're not historically, you know, people. So Merton and Alden are both very old Cornish names. Right. So that's where I got them from that. So I try to set them, say, if you've got Saxon people, like, yeah, I, I just try and find Saxon names that suit the character right. of what they are. Yeah. So, so it would go like that. So you get some Breton names and some some Cornish names and some Saxon ones and, and uh, a few French ones as well. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm often on, you know, baby naming, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> character, find character names. So, yeah, thank goodness I have my children because goodness knows what their names would be. <laughs> so, what is the most difficult thing about writing characters from the opposite sex? Because there's quite a lot of men in your book. It's all men and there's a few women well, in my yeah. books, mostly men. I don't really think about it. I just kind of write it and just, you know, I've got three boys, so I think that helps okay. a little bit with, you know, <laughs> what they're like. But no, I don't really think about, oh my gosh, I've got to write a male character. What do I do? I just I just write them and hope that they're, they come across as how they're meant to. Well, they certainly so, do. Yeah, they certainly do. It's brilliant. Yeah. So apart from the names, do you hide any other secrets in your books that only a few people will find? Because I'm guessing only people who sort of know a little bit about Cornish and Saxon names and stuff like that, they would kind of know that these names belong to those tribes, if I may say that. Yeah, there's sometimes there's little secrets, there's little secrets, like there's, there's little things in the stories that I think once the series is complete, you'll go, oh, yeah, I, I, I saw that coming, but I didn't see it. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a few little hints. That some, if something bad's going to happen, there's a couple of little hints that's going through the story, but they don't necessarily happen in that book. You know, they might right. happen in the next one or the next one. Ah. And, so there's little clues that's going on. But, yeah, 
it's uh, <laughs> good fun to be a writer you can put all these little things in can't you it it's is good. certainly yeah <laughs> so but is there anything that you find particularly challenging in your writing um i think are probably the most challenging scenes well probably are with merton actually with um his illnesses and his conditions that was particularly hard to write because he has scoliosis oh, so okay. which comes on quite suddenly oh and i actually had it was my inspiration was between my two best friends actually both of them my best friends from a very long time ago and they both had this condition with a couple of years of each other oh. and it was very sudden they thought one thought that she'd um hurt her back she fell over and hurt her back right. and the other one thought it just been she pulled a muscle and it wasn't it was scoliosis Gosh. and within a year for both of them which is why they were they were absolutely in a terrible place oh my. so when i was writing you know merton with his damaged back yeah it was going from one of them to the other and they would go no that doesn't work you have, right. it goes like this and then so one of my dear friends she um we actually pretended to try and get her to throw an axe and <laughs> to see what she could do. do yeah. So that, you know, I spent a long time with her and she was going, well, I can't actually lift that and I can't do this. So oh. that was quite challenging to do. And to do it to someone who everyone loves, like, I wanted to do that as well because it, I wanted to show people that, you know, disability happens to people that we love, you know? Yeah. And it, but it doesn't change the person that we love. Right. It's just another problem. So having Merton, someone who everyone cares about, yeah. going through something like this, and actually you realise he's still the same person. Yeah. He's got some added difficulties now. So that was yeah. probably the most difficult part to write, was that scene with Merton, when he finds out that there's something seriously wrong with him, and he's not going to be able to do what he used to do. So that's... Yeah. And to keep it real for that time when they didn't know what yeah. it was you know they, they would have probably thought he was cursed or you know something awful like that yeah so that was that was really harsh that's hard to write and also writing about the church that can be quite difficult to write about yeah. as well because some of their ideas back then we think were barbaric you know right. and, and to try and write that balance you know so you have so you're not completely condemning but at the same time you actually actually know this this wasn't right you shouldn't really have been subjecting your subjects to this yes. it's, it's, it's quite a challenge to get right those I think those two things are the hardest to write about I'm so sorry to hear about your friends though and now it makes complete sense to me when I read about Merton's condition it was so real it yeah. was so real and I was like oh I wanted to climb inside the book and fix him <laughs> yeah no, no no I mean it was so when we were doing it, was like my friends was having it was, as I was writing each paragraph, I was sending it off to her, and she's like, "No, that's wrong. Do yeah. it has to be like this, you know. I, I do this." And then once I'd finished all the chapters that Merton were in, I sent them. My other friend had just had major reconstructive surgery, right. so she couldn't do anything. She came out of hospital. And I said, "You can read this." <laughs> and okay, came all these chapters, and she was like, "Okay." <laughs> so it was like, so I had that kind of that was really yeah. helpful. I wouldn't be able to write that yeah. without. Them, I don't, it wouldn't have been possible because it would have just been unrealistic and I needed to get, I wanted to, I always want the books to be realistic, although they're, you know, set in that time where yeah. it's all legends. I but, wanted the people to be believable and what they happened to them. So it was also, I mean, I deal with a lot, you know, post-traumatic stress, all of yeah. that happens in my books as well. So they're not, you know, bad things happen to them and then they, they have to recover from it. They just don't get on with it. And I think Alden, that's, or, you know, one of the brothers is is a perfect example of yeah. where he doesn't cope very well no. with things happen to him. Mm. So he can be quite a challenge to write about sometimes because he's 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 quite moody. So he's one minute he's alright, and the next minute he's like, oh my gosh, this is the end of the world. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's it's trying to get those emotions in so it's real. I think that's it's quite a challenge, but well, I, I want it to be real. So yeah, and it certainly is. I mean, this is the interesting thing. I found that even though the books are set in that particular period, they're very modern. They, you can feel with the characters as though it's happening to somebody today. I yeah, loved but, that. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, if she wants to me, I could write it all in Old English, you know, mm. and no one would understand a word no. what I was saying. I, I didn't want the characters to be foreign. Do no. you know what I mean? I didn't want them to be so far away that you couldn't yeah. relate to them. So... I, I wanted it to be for a modern audience that they could understand 
what these people are going through, but yeah. in the time constraint that they're in, yeah, it, it's you know, it's like putting yourself back a thousand years. Yeah, you know, exactly. Hope, yeah. You know, so. So, it's yeah, absolutely that's... that because you do think, well, wow, if that happened to me, because it's so real that you, and I think that this is why people love Merton so much, because you can really relate to him. You can really, it, it feels like you're him when you're reading the book and you go through all the things that he does and you kind of think, well, if that was me, how, how would I react? You know, how would I get through these things that's being thrown at him? is very relatable and I think that's probably why these books are doing so well yeah well hopefully that's sort of yeah. <laughs> that's the idea <laughs> yeah well they are clearly so I know that you have children and you lead a very busy life does your family support your writing or how do you manage it because I think that that is a thing that I hear from a lot of writers they go I haven't got time I just it's time to find the time yeah. it is a juggling act to, to get it all in place I have my days are very structured in the sense that I've got to be here and here and here and here mm. and then hopefully at some point I will squeeze in a, a couple of hours of writing if I can manage it but yeah and as I, on the whole my family great you know my husband's great my you know he's very supportive he was actually the one who said to me when are you ever going to publish this book because it's you know right. <laughs> you've been doing it for so oh, long wow. you, yeah. get a move on uh, and my daughter loves it she loves because she gets to read it before anyone else. So, oh, you know, yeah. I get a few raised eyebrows. You get, they're not going to like that. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> so, so she really enjoys doing that. That's it's, wonderful, uh, yeah. I mean, I think because without support behind you, it's really hard to be a, a writer. It really is. Because yeah. it's so yeah. isolating. I mean, you kind of have to shut yourself off and do your thing, don't you, really? Yeah. It also helps. I mean, to have my daughter read it, I think because then I'm not going to write anything that I wouldn't be comfortable with her reading. Right, <laughs> so yes. It, it, you know, it makes me make yeah. sure that it's, it's suitable yeah. for a younger audience if, if they so wanted to read it. So Yeah, so because it's, it's, um, these books are aimed primarily at young adults, am I correct? Yeah, yeah about 16 plus, I'd yeah. say, on them. So, yeah, okay. there's a few issues that are a little bit, you know, difficult for younger audiences, but, yeah, yeah 16 plus. So if she can read it, then and she doesn't have a problem, then then yeah. hopefully that's everyone a, else can It's a, a great way to test it, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she does have arguments with me. She goes, "You can't do that. You cannot do that to Merton anymore. <laughs> no more." <laughs> <laughs> well, I sometimes feel like calling you and going, "No, don't do that." <laughs> no, you dare kill off that character. No. I'm, like, I'm sorry. <laughs> You know, if you get really invested in, yeah. then you know it really works. You hear people saying things like, "Oh, I really love reading. It's very calming. It's very serene." But then I want to—I'm shouting at the writer. I'm throwing the book <laughs> against the wall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's fair, isn't it? Book reaction. <laughs> yeah, it's good. So, where is your favorite place to write? Do you have a favorite place? I hide in my bedroom actually, oh. under a load of load of blankets. Oh. Actually, at the I had a lovely blanket um, given to me by author M.T. McGee. She sent oh, one over. Oh, yes. And yeah. a really nice, thick woolen one. So I, I cuddle that. up on my bed, all these cushions behind my back. So, the, you know, not the best way to write. And the laptop on my lap, some headphones in, and then, you know, I'm hidden in the world under this big, cozy woolen blanket. <laughs> <laughs> and right there, the quietest room in the house, so I hide. <laughs> You're not the only one. I believe that Marion Keys writes in her bed as well. It's a good place to write. It's a good place to write. <laughs> I do too, from time to time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in writing in my pajamas. Yes, brilliant. We know that you took ages to write the first book, but how long were you? Did you consider yourself a part-time writer before you became a full-time one? I, I still consider myself part-time because I'm just always trying to find time. Oh, really? Do you? <laughs> Like, it's not like I can get up in the morning and, you know, sit down at a computer all day because I'm flying around all over the place and I still work. So it's, um, you know, trying to get the time. I'd love to be full time, like, you know, get up in the morning. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it would be brilliant. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'd be able to stick with it, though. I'd probably get a little bit bored, to be honest. And, and... <laughs> well, I don't know. The characters you create won't keep you, won't keep you bored for long. <laughs> they do sometimes drive me crazy. I can tell you that. <laughs> 
I think most of us would want that. Most of us want to be full-time authors, and, and sadly, yeah. it can't always be possible. But so how many unpublished and half-finished books do you have that you haven't sort of let us well, see yet? Apart from the appalling Lancelot de Lac one, um, <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's just the new one. So, it's, so that's oh my own, about 106,000 words at the moment. Wow, okay. 106,000 uh, words. I think that was the last look. Right. And I'm nowhere near the end, so it's, you know, it's wow. going to be another it's a, a, big book, like yeah. a princess was. So yeah, hopefully by the end of the year, it should be out, so if I can get, get the time to finish it. But here's the thing, be... though. I mean, even though the books, apart from The Dulac Devil, that was a novella, am I right? No, The Dulac Devil is a full one. It's a full uh, one. Pitchfork Rebellion was a Oh, novella. that's the, yeah. But yeah. but even though they're long, they, they don't feel long to read. You kind of want the story to continue on, even after they've finished. It's one of those things where you close the book and you go, hmm, I didn't really want that to finish because I want to know what's going to happen on. And now that you've talked about the Lancelot book, I'm dying to know <laughs> yeah, to what's happened. You'll have to, today. yeah, you'll have There's to drag it out. To what he gets up to, you know, through these books, you see, yeah. oh my gosh, with, with Tegan and Tegan and all that, you yeah. know, the things that, yeah, she gets up to as well, and her story with Lancelot's quite amusing. But um, so yeah, the Lancelot story is is in the book. Yeah, I might one day go back and actually rewrite that terrible manuscript <laughs> and um, and see what I can make of Lancelot. So it's, yeah, uh, it's I... like a cross between Merton and Alden. He's you know uh, between the two of them. It's too, yeah. um I think it was because, remember the, the movie, I think, was it Franco Nero who played him in the yeah. movie? Yeah, and was, yeah. Yeah, so everybody fell in love with him, including me. So when you said, I've written this book about Lancelot, I'm thinking, oh, she wrote a book about Franco Nero. <laughs> that, it, actually, it actually follows Lancelot and Tristan, that book. I mean, it is yeah. absolutely awful, but it follows those two oh. on there their journey through Arthur's court and, right. and to the end of Arthur's court. So it sounds uh, amazing. You have to write it. You have, we I, I, need to read I, I it. I probably will. Well, if I haven't <laughs> had enough of them by then, I might go back <laughs> and do the Lancelot story, but we should see. Uh, oh, no. if I... <laughs> That'd be brilliant. That would be absolutely brilliant. So if you didn't write, and this may be um, a moot question, but if you didn't write, what work would you most like to have done? Um, I don't know. I, I think I, mean, I do. I choose history as well. So I think I'd just be doing that and doing some music. Mm -hmm. You know those kind of things. The kind of things I've I've always done. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, probably just that. Really, that's what I'd be doing. So I didn't realise you did music. So would you? Could I ask you about that a little bit? You can if you want. I teach piano. Oh wow! And, okay. A uh, little guitar. I don't do a lot of it now because I just don't have the time, but I have my my die-hard students so, um, <laughs> who put up with me. So, yeah, I enjoy doing that. It's good fun. Wow, you're a multi-talented lady, clearly. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me ask you this. You've won all these awards. You are a best-selling author already internationally. Is this enough, or what does literary success look like to you? I think it would be people still reading my books 10, 20 years down the line, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, you know, still talking about them. Right. And that would probably be, you know, that's the author who writes about, you know, Lancelot's story. Yes. <laughs> she does write it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, that would probably be, you know, to still keep the momentum going. <laughs> so I think you're published as an indie author. Am I right? Yes, yeah. What, mot yeah. what motivated you to become an indie author? Because your books are so good. There's this whole thing around being an indie author still, unfortunately, that people think if you are an indie author, it seems as though you weren't able to get a publishing contract somewhere. But you clearly made a decision to be an indie author instead of a, a published author with a, pu with a publishing company. Yes, I don't. I didn't even bother. I don't know why, really. I think it was just the case that I'm. I'm not very patient, and mm -hmm. um, I don't think I would have the patience to <laughs> send my books off and wait. Yeah. So I had this. I had the chronicle. The Dark Chronicles written, and I was like, 
I just want to get it up. So mm-hmm. obviously I didn't do it quite like that. It took me a good year to yeah. you know, get it all sorted. But, and also I'm quite a control freak, I think. So I wanted to have control of everything. And, you know, I didn't want anyone telling me that, you know, that was wrong. And it will not, obviously editors edit my work, but I didn't yeah. want anyone telling me that the story needed to go this way when I actually right. wanted it to go yeah. another way. And, you know, I wanted control of what the covers were going to look I, I was just a control freak, really. I just wanted to do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad to meet another one. I'm exactly the same. <laughs> and, and so talking about your covers, they are beautiful. They are stunning. I mean, and they, it's almost like they're a brand. They're branding yeah, the, the whole... Yeah, I used to be proud of my cover designer. His name's Pete, and he... I, I went to him and said, I, I need a cover for my book and I don't know what I need to see on there. And he was like, oh, give me the synopsis. So I sent it to him and then he came back with that design of wow. the first book. And uh, they tweak a few things. That was it. He did all of that. And I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, that's amazing. Mm. I, you know, I've never come up with anything like that ever. So I just, he just, you know, he gets the synopsis for every book and then he, he comes up with the next design. It's so brilliant. I, I just tell him who's on the cover, so right. he's like, right. <laughs> so that's it. That's as far as I yeah. my input to it, and then he just sends me the the proofs to go through, and it goes back and forth until we're happy. So yeah, oh, that's really good. because the covers are really good, and and I mean in general, covers are really important. Um, but your covers are good in more than one ways. And one of the ways that I found fascinating when I was looking at them is that they tell the story of the book that they're on. And you don't find that very often, I think, where people have a cover that actually gives you the story in a picture. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful and really effective, I think. So, yeah, I mean, my favourite cover, I think it's probably the princess, the like princess's cover, it's, because I just yeah. said, I said to him, you know... Um, who I wanted on the cover, I wanted Mandy on the cover, and I said, but I want her in a church that's neglected and it's yeah. cold and it's horrible. Yeah. So um, if you look at the, ca- the cover very, very carefully in the background, you can see cobwebs and you can oh, wow. see, you know, yes. you know, and I was like, oh my gosh, that's just so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's the one that I want to do. <laughs> so, it's brilliant. Really, yeah. really good. Yeah, they are stunning. I, I urge people to have a look at them. They are beautiful. So what marketing strategies do you find the most helpful? And do you have any resources that you would recommend to other authors or aspiring authors? Um, well, I do. I mean, I blog a lot. So my blog has, you know, about 40,000 page hits every month. Wow. And it's, um, it's a very busy blog, but it's probably because I invite a lot of people on who are very, very, you know, <laughs> very good authors, very yeah. know their stuff. So it's a history yeah. blog. You know, you, you get from everything from the Roman Empire all the way up to 1960s on there. <laughs> so, um, so that's you know, I'm always on there doing something. I live on Twitter. I'm I'm terrible with Twitter. I just live on there all the time. <laughs> but the other thing is email marketing. I think is the that's the big one really. Yeah. If you know, do that. But it is hard. And it's constant work. And that's the only thing. The only problem really of the indie author is it's all on you. You know, because you <laughs> you've chosen to be this control freak and now it's <laughs> you have to control everything so that's yeah. probably the headache of it is, is the marketing and, and and trying things and i think that's that's um you know what works for one author doesn't work for another that's so true. It, it's trial and error as yeah. to um what's going to work for your books you yeah. know and that's that's what i find it and it always changes so you know at one point i had a lot of success with facebook but now not so much so right. it's back to twitter again so it's you know yeah. it's um it it's true isn't that. it it's very fluid yeah it's always changing as well isn't mm. it it's always moving and so it's, it's always trying new things and will that work does that work you mentioned email as being really important for marketing why is that i think it's it's usually because you're targeting people who want to be targeted mm-hmm. so it's not like just sending a tweet out and you know hoping that someone who might be interested is going to see it Mm -hmm. you're actually targeting people who are may more than likely interested in what you're trying to sell them so i think that's why it's you get more success with something like that authors of different levels of success are going to be listening to this and i want to give them something from very successful authors 
that people who are just starting out can use as well. So that's why I asked the question. What is the most important thing, do you think, you would say that you've learned as a result of your writing journey? I f just try and do it, you know, I, mean, I was like, if you look back for like 15 years, I was like, oh, I'm not good enough, oh, I can't write, oh, this is true, <laughs> this is true. I mean, that first book was appalling, but it is, I think you, the doubt, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's lots of writers out there who've got brilliant manuscripts, but they doubt themselves so mm. much that they never, they just, you know, put it in a journal and forget about it, yeah. and, and I think that's the, the big thing is to actually put yourself out there and, you know, hope someone likes it and when they don't you take it on the chin and you know <laughs> and then you, it's another day and you get on with it you know get yeah. on with it so I think it's just you know just if you, if you enjoy writing then just write and you're going to get better at it and you know that's the main thing I think is just to keep doing it and keep doing it and who knows where you're going to be you know I didn't expect to ever you know, win all of these awards, it was, you know, I was like, oh, okay, I, I, I suppose I can write a little bit then, I'm, I suppose I'm okay, but still, I mean, even I do, I'll, I'll write, you know, a chapter, and I'll, I'll look at it and go, oh my gosh, you know, this is as bad as, you know, Lancelot de Lac's story, it's like, I have to completely scrap it and start again, so it's, yeah. you know, you have good writing days, and bad, oh, I certainly do, I have good writing days, and, and, and bad ones, and yeah. Oh, it's all part of the journey, isn't it? It is a journey as well. It writing. is a journey, definitely, yeah. It's not a case of just writing a book and plonking it on Amazon and hoping for the best, is it? No, no, yeah. I mean, if you want to do it right, it's a lot of a lot of work. Yeah. But there, there's a lot of authors out there who are lovely and, you know, there's a community Absolutely. of really lovely authors out yeah. there who want help and they want, you know, they're yeah. happy to give you advice and... Yeah. Um, and I mean, I know Tony Richie, he's, um, he's, uh, he writes Tudor, Tudor books. And yeah. he, at the beginning, right at the beginning, when I, I was first, you know, going up on Twitter, going, oh, I'm trying to publish a book, what do I do? He was like straight in there, you know, you do this and you do that, send oh, me right. your blurb, you know. Yeah. So he was that kind of, you know, really encouraging That's fantastic. You know, person. Yeah. You, you need someone like that. He says, you know, yeah. do this. No, you don't do that. Don't do that. You know, it was like that. <laughs> I'm sure Tony used to get fed up with me going, how do you do this? And he'd be like, oh, for goodness sake. But, you know, that's what some of the, you know, Tony, for one, is, is you know, he does that for a lot of people. He helps a lot. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's the community you want to be involved with. Because I actually thought, you know, it would be a lonely, you know, being mm. an author is quite a lonely you know, profession. And, and you know, to, I don't think it really is because when you're writing, you're in a different world. Mm -hmm. And when you're not writing, you're with this community of, yes. you know, minded people who uh, who all kind of want to help each other which I think is you know a really nice I wasn't expecting that yeah. at all when you know I, I was first you know naively saying what do I do <laughs> but um <laughs> but yeah I think that's the big surprise for a lot of people is yeah. that those other authors are supportive and you know we're all in this together yeah rather than that my book's better than yours sort of you know yeah I just wanted to to add something to what you so brilliantly said, actually, is that I find part of the writing journey for me personally has also been a self-discovery. And that was a huge surprise. I didn't know that that would happen because I wasn't writing about myself. I was writing about other characters. And yet I discovered a lot more about myself in the process. Is that something that you found as well? I think I, I, you know, I realise I have quite a dry sense of humour. <laughs> so, you know, like, so, you know, especially some of the characters, and you're like, um, and I also kind of, I think I'm a people watcher, you know, and I didn't realise I was, you know, and I, I didn't realise that I would be watching people's characteristics and, and how they act, and you know, right. um, which I think is something, but you, I kind of like must have been subconsciously doing that all my life to yeah. be able then to, to get make these you know very different people absolutely in, yeah in the books it's fun <laughs> isn't it it's fun to to do um discover all these things about ourselves and about you know what we're doing and i think that that's part of the journey literally um not just creating stories and other people and other characters that we can live vicariously through <laughs> yeah. but also to delve deeper into who we really are so the only other thing I wanted to ask is, where do you publish your books? It's Amazon. 
and, okay. you know, I do KGP, so Amazon, yeah. Yeah, because so, I do that as well. Okay, yeah. yeah. No, I just thought I'd ask that because there's this whole debate about whether if you're as successful as you are, whether you should go wide or whether you should remain with Amazon, Amazon. with Kindle, yeah. So I well, just I, wondered. I, I get a lot of reads from KU, you know, Kindle Unlimited, mm. so I can't see why it would be worth my... Yes, <laughs> exactly. Worth, yeah. Go yeah. wide with, you know, the, mm. the Kindle version or the ebook well, version of it. Exactly. I mean, and also because, I mean, Amazon is the biggest bookstore yeah. in the world. Um, so, yes, I'm with them as well. But I know that there are authors who have a lot of success going wide yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah like you said yeah. earlier, what works for one maybe doesn't work for another. I've, I've never gone wide, so I don't actually know what that would be like. Yeah. I always went straight in with, you know, Kindle Unlimited. Yeah. And it's because I want people to be able to borrow the books. That was wonderful. Thank you so, so much for a fantastic chat with you. It was lovely to meet you finally. I've learned a lot. I hope the listeners will do too. And um, I'd love to talk to you again once you've published your new book and and maybe the Lancelot book. That the would Lancelot. be fantastic. That's it. That's it now. I've said it now and everyone you... would be wanting to read the Lancelot story. Mm. Oh, yes. <laughs> no. Yes, you've said it now and now we're all waiting. That's it now, yes. You have to wait a bit longer, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for the rest of your life. I just don't know if it's ever going to happen. You're so funny. Thank you so much, Mary. That was lovely. Really lovely.